Hello, and welcome to a presentation from the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. My name is Ann DeSantis. I'm the Executive Director, and I'm pleased to bring to you a presentation through our Families in Crisis series, meaning that that's what we are all about here at the St. Raymond Onatus Foundation. And this presentation will help you and your family to grow closer to Christ and to His Blessed Mother, especially those who are going through some kind of adversities, because that's what we do. We, we reach out to you through our charisms. Learn more about us at our website at nonatus.org. So I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. His name is Carlos Solorzano. He is a Catholic author. And so, Carlos, thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really a blessing for us. And I'm going to start out by reading your bio so people can get to know you a little bit better is that you have your BA in, and MA in Religious Studies from California State Long Beach. Carlos is certified through the Theology of the Body Institute near Philadelphia, PA, and he has been teaching high school theology for 25 years and has been giving talks at various schools, parishes, and other Catholic communities for over 10 years. He's also a featured speaker through Catholic Speakers Organization. He lives in Arizona with his family and is a parishioner at St. Martin de Poor's Catholic Parish in, uh, is it Sarita? Yeah, that's one way to say it. <laughs> uh, he is currently working at St. Augustine Catholic High School in Tucson, Arizona. He's the author of three books with religious themes, including I Am His Mother, which is presented as a Catholic memoir uh, of our Blessed Mother as she reflects on the life of Jesus from a mother's point of view. So if you want to go to Amazon and check out this book, I'm going to show it to you. Now, it might look backwards on the video here, but it's called I Am His Mother. It's available again on Amazon. So without further ado, uh, we are going mm -hmm. to listen to Carlos's presentation. Thank you so much again, Carlos. Thank you for having me. Um, so as you had asked me, I wanted to tell a little story about my background with Our Lady in my life. Uh, growing up, in a Mexican-American family. Um, that was going to be all over the place. Um, my parents both had a strong devotion to Our Lady, but I think that the big root of it was my mother's father. His mother had passed away when he was eight. So Our Lady Guadalupe was really his maternal figure most of his life. And his love for her was something that he passed on to all of his children. So my mom, who was very close to her dad, um, she tended to follow along with that devotion. And then she taught us a lot about her while we were growing up. And she would talk a lot about, she, she went to Catholic school and was educated by the Carmelite nuns. And a lot of times there, the prayers that they would teach the kids to say was to Jesus through Mary. And of course, we all know, it's a very human story because obviously, you know, when our mother talks to us, it's a very, it's important. They're very important words to us. I mean, it was really nice this past Mother's Day to see how many people, whether it was on social media or just going back to work on Monday and talking to my students and them talking about how much, how many things they did for their moms over the weekend and, and wanting to show her how much they love her. And it's funny because they reminded me of this post I saw on Facebook one day where it said, don't worry about how much you love Mary. You could never love her as much as Jesus did. And it was just, you think about that, that was his mom. And when we look at our lives and the gifts that we have growing up, you know, our parents are a great gift. And, and I think of my parents a lot because I didn't realize how blessed I was in a sense, because my, my dad was a catechist as well as a, a language teacher. My mom just had that strong devotion in her Catholic faith. And so my father was really good at being able to break down different parts of the faith to us. And my parents certainly had a sense of, you know, right and wrong and their sin and like their, you know, what God taught is what was true. But the one thing that my mom always told my sister and I, and, and honestly, it's very maternal. And in a sense, you really, you see the gift of, of the loving that was behind it was she always used to tell us, you know, this is right, this is wrong. But if you do wrong and you sin, if you ask God to forgive you, he will. So that that sense of God's mercy was always there. And um, so when I grew up and I started to meet other people from in church or even from other uh, Christian families, and sometimes they were very judgmental or parents who were very strict, you know, kind of Bible beat them. It was actually kind of painful for me because it was kind of like, well, that's not the loving God I grew up with. 
And again, certainly I was aware of, of what was considered sinful, but there was always that reminder that God is merciful. And a lot of that comes from just, you know, imagining how Mary would have raised him. I mean, like a lot of times, you know, we live in a very Protestant country, so I kind of want to dive into some of the things that we encounter. But like a lot of times there'll be things like, well, well where is all this in the Bible? And it's interesting because you know the Catholic faith definitely the traditions we have can, do not um, counter scripture; they don't contradict scripture. But it's funny how a lot of times we, what we should be doing is kind of like calling a timeout, saying, "Well, hold on," because the way we interpret scripture is not the same. You know, some of you are literalists or have a different method where you know we look at the message behind it, and of course, being Catholics, we know there's a lot of underlying meanings in the text. And, and or some things that are implied or kind of lead in a different direction. So a lot of times we forget that a lot of our devotions are biblically based. And while some of our Protestant brothers and sisters may not agree with us on what it means, they can't really argue that it is biblically sound. So a lot of that started for me in college because I was going to school and I was meeting a lot of non-Catholic Christians. And we had a lot of really good civil discussions about it. But there were times I can I could I felt like I wasn't really equipped to understand it. I mean, in my heart, I knew it was right, but I struggled to really sh share it. So I remember talking to my dad about it one day, and, and we actually went um, Catholic gift, gift shop shopping one day, and we bought a number of books that um, really break down the faith, but then also um, kind of teach you how to communicate with the Protestant uh, brethren out there, because just mainly to dialogue. And as soon as I started to really dig into it in that way, I, I really started to see how beautiful the Marian devotions were. Now, the first thing that's interesting about that is, you know, we also get a lot of heat as Catholics about devotion to saints, which is interesting because there's a lot of scripture that really enforces that. Like my favorite one to re reference, which we don't talk about a lot, is in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, where Jesus is telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus when the rich man dies. And there's a, I'm going to read it for a section where the rich man is in the abode of the dead, where he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm suffering torment in these flames. And it's interesting because Jesus is actually the one telling this story. And he's talking about someone calling out for help. You know, the, the rich man is not worshiping Abraham. He's asking for help. And it's interesting because in the Old Testament, whether it was the story of Abraham interceding for Sodom or Moses interceding for the Hebrews after the golden calf incident, they're interceding for the people on, on behalf of them. And it's interesting because we're always as Catholics told, well, why don't you pray directly to God? Well, we do. But these patriarchs were interceding on our behalf. You know, the people themselves should have done it. But yet this is in the scriptures where we see this happening. So it's interesting, too, because then in the book of Revelations, chapter eight, verses three to four, it actually says an angel was given a great quantity of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar that is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So the prayers of the saints are there. Now, I, I'm part of the reason why I share with you that I I went to Cal State Long Beach twice, 49er, you know, is because it was a secular college. The reason why I bring that up is because they were, you know, it was not going to be teaching us in the faith tradition, but they were, but they had a very critical eye towards a lot of things. And one thing I was always proud of was when we studied the Bible, even though it was from a secular point of view, our teacher was a expert in Hebrew and Greek. So a lot of times when we were following him along in class, we didn't have the same translations. And one of the things that I, I noticed was because I had this teacher, um, his name was Dr. Eisenman, for several classes. A lot of times he would ask, because we had my Bible, which I had the New American Bible, Catholic Bible, and then there were other students with the King James or whatever. And a lot of times he would read from his Bible, and then he would kind of give us the Greek or Hebrew. And then he would ask stu students, can you share with me what yours says? You, 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 you. And it was interesting because almost every time we did that, he'd say, Solar Zanos is the most accurate of the translations. So like, okay. So I was very proud to be Catholic at that point because that's our church being accurate with the translation because sometimes 
the Bibles are translated in a way where it, it fits more the theology than it does the the what the script the, the book actually says. Because I know in Acts, I, I, I forget which translation it was, but where the Greek really says, where Peter says, repent and be baptized. And obviously our church, we baptize people. There's some translations that say repent and be converted because they don't emphasize baptism. That's actually inaccurate. They're changing the text to fit the theology, not giving us the actual text. So again, that's something that we as Catholics should be very, very proud of because the text is, in the case of the a part of Revelations that I quoted, it actually um, is emphasizing the prayers of the saints and that God does hear them. And that they because as we teach in our church, even though they've passed away and they're in the presence of God, we are all one community, and that includes our Blessed Mother. So as I started digging more into this, there's a couple of things I do want to highlight. So in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 11, there's this interesting verse where it says, There is no remembrance of past generations, nor will future generations be remembered by those who come after them. So in a lot of ways, as we know, like when we talk about our grandparents and great-grandparents, because I mean, I, I only met one of my great grandparents and I don't remember because I was actually five months old when she died. My, uh, you know, my children still have three of their grandparents to this day. And I lost three of them before I was 12. So I don't remember a lot of things now, but obviously I, I don't have memories of my great grandparents. So with, you know, less than a hundred years, people are starting to be forgotten. And it's interesting because in the Magnificat, one of the things that Mary talks about in her praise to God is all generations will call me blessed. So she was going to be remembered. That was the gift she had of being Jesus's mother. And it's interesting because the only other person Bible where that's used is Abraham. And one of the four promises that God gave him is, you know, your name, you'll be a blessing to all communities. He's going to be remembered. So Mary was not to be forgotten. And it's interesting because while some people like to act like she doesn't really have any significance, it's like, well, let's think real quick. This is Jesus's mother. Let's just use a human example. I mean, I'm assuming and we're all adults here, maybe all of us are married. We all had to go through that moment of meeting our spouse's mother. Okay, I am blessed to get along with both my wife's parents. What's beautiful in, in my relationship with them was the day I married their daughter, they made it very clear because even my brother-in-law, his wife does it too. We were told to call them mom, dad. And there's no way I would say I don't love my mother-in-law. My kids adore their grandmother. My daughter is extremely close to grandma. Just it's just like, I am pleased to see that. If we walk the earth with Christ during his ministry and he introduced us to his mother, how would we have treated her? We would have not ignored her. We would have honored her. We would have praised her. We would have probably thanked her for raising him because we see the man that he was obviously as the Messiah, but also he was the example of what it was like to love everyone, including your enemy. So the fact that, you know, the scripture tells us that in Mary's praising God for this, that her name was to be remembered. That says a lot about how we're supposed to treat her. Now, what's interesting was that it pushed me to even start studying the prayer that we're known to say all the time, the Hail Mary. Now, as we know, the first half of the Hail Mary, we're literally reciting scripture. You know, we have from the Annunciation and we have from the Visitation. So it's the first two mysteries of the Joyful Mysteries of the Rosary. And I, as one time, I, I remember being at school at, at my job and at the last second, someone goes, okay, we want you to go in front of the whole school and do a a thorough discussion on the Hail Mary prayer. And I'm like, you know, on the spot. And I was just thinking, oh, okay, Lord, Holy Spirit, please. And it was interesting because the words that came upon my heart was I was thinking to myself about the first part, because this was the Annunciation. This is the angel Gabriel speaking to her. And um, the first thought, my reflections was, these are words from heaven, because they were sent by God to her. And there was something that I remember, because you had mentioned I, I had studied the Theology of the Body Institute. Christopher West said something that was beautiful. He said she was being asked to be his mother. It was like a proposal. He says, if you think about it, 
the way we portrayed Gabriel, he should have been kneeling. We, you know, we don't worship her, but we honor her. Then you hear, you have Elizabeth speaking her words, you know, carrying John the Baptist, the one who was going to preach his coming, this coming of her son. I'm going to prepare the people for him. You know, you're coming to me and I'm going to show you this other person. And this is Mary's son. So we're reciting this, these words that came upon Elizabeth's heart through the Holy Spirit. Probably John already proclaiming who he was. Because, you know, we use this a lot during the pro-life activities where the first person to recognize Jesus was an unborn baby. John's first proclamation of who Jesus was. So the first half of the Hail Mary prayer, we're reciting scripture. Now, the second half is interesting because I've actually heard two explanations. The Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners down at the hour of our death. Amen. One Jesuit priest gave a talk once where he said, that would put us in communion, say, with the crusaders who were fighting for the Holy Land, because some of them knew they were going to be close. They were at the hour of their death because some of them were going to die in battle defending the Holy Land. Whereas other teachers I've had have said, well, that was also something people were conscious of during the Black Plague, because, again, they were probably how many of them were at the hour of their death. So when I thought about that, I was thinking, again, that notion of communion of the saints I always feel like in this way, I'm praying with my brethren who came before us, like that whole tradition that's been passed on to us. So I feel that sense of community from those who who, practice, who taught their children this prayer and passed it on to us centuries before any of us were born. So in a lot of ways, that really gave me a, a deeper appreciation for the Hail Mary prayer because the solidarity with the community and the fact that we're reciting the scriptures that are honoring her. So these are, you know, this is biblical. I mean, some people can say, well, I don't know if I agree with that. That's fair. I mean, there's even different theologies within Catholicism, but at the same time, it's biblical. We, we can't deny that there are roots of our devotion to Our Lady in the Bible. Now, what I wanted to sort of bring up, because one of my loves is, is art. I, I'm, I'm a musician, but I love visual art because I can't draw and I can't paint. So I love to look at art that I can't do because it inspires me. And so whether it's uh, visual art or film, because because Anne, I know we've talked about this in, in some of your podcasts, a lot, a lot of the inspiration of a book I wrote on Mary was from films. It was certain scenes that I'd see with Mary in certain characters, and it just really blew my mind. I just thought, wow, this is beautiful stuff. So we we're always taught that, you know, Mary is this, this example of holiness. And it's interesting because when I think about that, and I and I, I look at what what we um what we teach. I um I always I I always bring this up with my students and ask the question, how beautiful is Mary? I mean, just think about like when you see a beautiful woman. Like I always I always marvel at my daughter because my daughter's fifteen, my mother in law's in her seventies, and my daughter will be like, Dad, Grandma's just beautiful. Mom is beautiful. You know, she's seeing them for how the way she loves them and. And it's like, imagine this woman, this, this immaculate, you know, this immaculate woman and how she looked to other people. I mean, she had to have this beauty that was just so inspiring. I mean, in some, in some sense, we forget that beauty is that thing that, you know, from, especially from a male's point of view, when you really love a woman, it's something you want to protect. And I think it's really important because I'm going to, another picture I want to bring up is a lot of times, and I saw, this, I saw a lot of great discussions on this last Christmas, a lot of people were asking, you know, like, there's a big debate about how, how old was Joseph when he married our Blessed Mother? And I know it was common in the ancient world where your wife could be much younger than you, and I'm not saying that that may not have been historically true. But some people would say, well, hold on a second. Does it really matter how old he is? Because to be honest, it seems like some people want to almost say, because of the fact that she was a perpetual virgin, I understand that there's something practical about that being true because of the fact that if Joseph was older and say he didn't have the same drive you would have in your younger days, fair enough. But the other thing to consider is, what did she look like in Joseph's eyes? Like, like when you look at Ephesians 5.25 and they talk about a husband 
laying his life down for his wife. That certainly is true in some cases where you would offer your wife life to protect your wife. But the theology also teaches us that if you see her for who she really is, rather than physically necessarily having to die, you would rather die than defile her. So when Joseph saw her and saw how beautiful she really was, he was thinking there's no way I would do anything to possibly defile this woman. And if you go back to my uh, studies with the Theology of the Body Institute, Christopher West, again, some of the beautiful reflections he would share with us, there was a reason why Joseph sought to divorce her quietly. The law gave him the right to shame her for what he thought she did. And when we think about, you know, a lot of times we forget that a betrothal was not an engagement. A betrothal was, they were, it was further than an engagement in our minds. You've made your commitment. An engagement today announces your intentions, but in a betrothal, you would also announce the day of the wedding. So it was deeper than, than an engagement. That's why the words say he sought to divorce her quietly. There was already a commitment. But Christopher West said he sought to divorce her quietly because he did not want to shame her. He struggled with this, of course, but deep down, he already knew who she was. Deep down, he probably knew she was telling the truth. It's just how hard would it be to understand that? And of course, you know, later he had the dream, which is interesting because it talks about, and we're going to go back to a patriarch in a second we do with Mary. Joseph is described as a man of righteousness. Another famous patriarch who was called righteous was Abraham. Both Abraham and Joseph had an encounter with the divine. Abraham, when the angel spared Isaac, Joseph in his dream, when he was told to take our blessed mother as his wife. And it's very inspiring to me because we think to ourselves, these are the people God the Father gave to Jesus to raise him. So it's like when you think about it, it's very inspiring to, to, to think about that, to realize that. But we all are capable of being those type of people. You know, like we're all saints in training and we're all able to be like that. Mary's our model of holiness. And, you know, we are always taught to pursue that and, and to be like her. And of course, the beautiful thing about our faith is that when we do, um, you know, struggle or we fall, we're able to, um, you know, confess our sins and get back to where we were. Now, we, uh, Anne, you were talking about the um, the notion of th this difficult time. I came across this picture on, on Facebook, actually, and I absolutely love it. It's this girl in the dark outfit, and it says, sometimes we just need our mom. And right now, I mean, there's a lot going on, you know, with the whole Supreme Court case and you know, one of the struggles I have as a high school theology teacher is we all know the church teaches that we, you know, the, the, the parents are the primary educator of the child. And that, I, and I absolutely believe that, but we have more and more children coming to these schools that they don't have parents at all. They're maybe physically present, but psychologically, emotionally absent. And there, there are times that we, that myself or my colleagues, we, we take on that parental role with these kids and it's it's a little scary right now because in arizona we we end in may because it's i guess it's the heat so i'm actually right now in the last week with regular class with my seniors and we have two more regular class days in the next week is their finals and they graduate a week from saturday so I, you know i'm excited for them but i know the ones who are um going through personal struggles and obviously at that point myself and my colleagues cannot be physically present with them every day like we are right now so we're trying to direct them to see where they can go to find fulfillment but also to have that guidance from some type of parental figure and you know the saints our blessed mother our lord you know they are mentors to us they're you know i, I understand jesus christ is our lord and savior he's our god but he's also our friend you know he came as a person to be our friend to show us the way but to show us you know, in a lot of ways, we realize he has gone through all the same things we've gone through. But we also forget what Mary has gone through. I mean, she has suffered. I mean, um, as a father, I mean, I, I, I love my kids and, I, and I, I can't think of a stronger love I have for anything. But I mean, everything from 
being in the delivery room when my kids were born to, you know, watching my wife, you know, raise them. I mean, I, I mean, I don't sure you can re reflect this too. There, I remember those days when my wife would be like, I don't know how to explain it, but as soon as those kids were born, these instincts just kicked in and I knew what to do. I hear them cry or I just know what they're thinking. I know what they're feeling. Like I, my sister one time, my nephew had, there was something wrong with him. She had two doctors see him and they said he was fine. And she goes, no, I gave birth to him. I know there's something wrong. She got the third opinion. He found out what was wrong with him. You know, I mean, who loves you more than your mother? You know, and I, and I, I respect the fact that my children, I, I don't have the same connection to them that my wife does because I didn't carry them. I didn't give birth to them. So there is this woman, Mary of Nazareth, who is the only person to have this relationship with Jesus Christ. So it's like, how do we not look to her to try to, especially to know him through her eyes? I mean, I've learned a lot of times with my students even, it's like, try to see your peers, especially the ones that you struggle to get along with through their parents' eyes. Because I know, I mean, I, I, they, they sanctify me too. I mean, it requires patience on my part, but I, I don't look at them with that same love that their mother or father would or your grandparents, whatever. So it's like, I don't know what that's like but I do know because of my own experiences, how much their parents love them. So it's very important for us. And that's a whole different view of Jesus. And that was actually what led me to write the book because it just, you know, that was again, the idea that my mother had taught us that, you know, to Jesus through Mary. But then my mom would also talk a lot about like, okay, well imagine his life and the moment she followed him, you know, watching him grow up, you know, all those moments. You know, like my uh, daughter's a freshman in high school right now. She's finishing her first year of high school. Right? It's like, that was fast. <laughs> and my son's already finishing his first year of college. Again, that was fast. And I always wondered what it was like for Mary because she knew who Jesus was. She knew what it was going to be like when he got older. There had to be those moments like, okay, well, he's like 10 years old right now. We have time. Okay, he's 15. We have time. There was that moment where she had to realize it started. And this, every time someone posts this picture, which I'm gonna share right now, it always gives me chills because I can only imagine what they were both feeling at that moment. When Jesus is about to go off in the desert, and this is a, a picture someone painted where Mary's saying goodbye to him. And it gets to me because I'm sure they were both scared. And, um, you know, but they both knew it had to be done. It, this, was part of, this was part of the journey. I'm sure our blessed mother was very happy to see him when he came back. But, um, you know, at that point, the ministry begins. And even then, you know, we have a couple of years to go. It's going to be a few years. And of course, once Palm Sunday arrives and here we go, and it's time to, you know, where it's gonna be, it's gonna be rough. And Ann, you and I were talking about this last week where I said in a lot of ways, if you think about it, she probably had to deny every maternal instinct she had when he was on the cross. You know, the passion of the Christ, I think every parent agrees the part where he falls, that's the hardest thing to watch. But we've been there, you know, whether the kids are struggling emotionally, physically, you're there to comfort them. And all those moments where he had to suffer, she realized he had to do it alone. But we still realized that there was comfort for him because she was there. He, he was not alone. She was there. And I, I can't imagine the pain she felt seeing him like that. I mean, people have questioned, you know, me for years in the classes, you know, how when you watch the passion, was it that, was it that horrific? And I go, well, the Romans, you know, you didn't have the same civil rights you have today in our country back then. I mean, they, there's historical accounts talking about how they got bored with crucifixion. So they tried different things. And if it caused you to be in more agony, they didn't care. You know, you were a criminal, you deserve this. So it was, you know, it was not pleasant, you know, even, Looking at the way Christ is portrayed on the cross, there were other people that it was much worse. But still, in his case, in the agony he endured, she was there to witness all of this and to 
you know, again, I cannot imagine how hard it must have been for her, her to be there. So, and I don't know if you wanted to chime in because, you know, I'm a dad and all that. And I, I felt great pain with my kids, but I'm not a mom. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing. Beautiful presentation so far. Really appreciate all that you're doing to enlighten all of us here with the St. Raymond and Nottis Foundation, not only for the people who are on this uh, actual Zoom meeting, but the ones that are watching on the podcast later on. Yeah. Uh, yes, as a mother, I think, you know, that empathy that you have for your children and their suffering, uh, I can't even imagine what it was like for her as the mother of Christ to watch what, what he went through. And you're right, there's that special connection too that mothers have with their children. And so that's why I really like the book that you wrote. And I know we're going to talk about that too, uh, okay. called, again, I Am His Mother, available on Amazon. I, I really love this book and highly recommend it for, for those watching. Um, so anything else that you want to share? Because uh, I would love for people to hear, you know, you obviously have a very deep devotion to Our Lady. Could you be able to share with us maybe in some short words, how did you grow so much in your relationship with her? Um, I learned a lot about um, taking it in, you know, taking in your faith. Um, it's funny because uh, there was a, in the, at the Theology of the Body Institute, there, there's three core courses and the rest you kind of choose what you want. The one, two, and three course. And the second course, I, it's actually called Into the Deep. And Christopher had, um, he had said some things to start the course. And as soon as he, he said it, it was almost like you feel when you're on a roller coaster, when you're at the top and you just drop and you're like, whoa. He said something that was just, it really hit me hard where he said, the church was Marian before it was Petrine because the first disciple was Mary. She trusted. She said, let it be done to me according to your will. We're taught in our devotions, men and women, you know, let it be done to me. Like, you know, our job as Catholics is to let God form us. You know, we're to conform to God's will. We're not supposed to be God's advisors. So Mary allowed God to essentially penetrate her, to enter her, and, to, and she did it with trust. You know, the Petrine church is the church that, you know, Peter, the disciples going out to preach. So that's what a lot of us do in our evangelistic work. So, but we can't give what we don't have. So I've learned to try to allow those graces to just penetrate me. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's difficult for men because we, we try to be problem solvers and, you know, where moms are, they feel things a lot. And, um, and I realized that there are times that we have to take on that feminine role of just receiving and, and allowing it to transform us. And um, I learned when it comes to the faith to trust that, to trust that that, that Holy Spirit working on us. And, um, I, and every, everything from whether it's that point about being Mar like Mary-like to a, a mentor of mine years ago that told me, you know, that my big problem is I, I want answers all the time. He goes, sometimes you have to stay on the course and realize that as you're walking the path, you maybe you're not ready. Yet. Like you yourself are working on yourself enough where if the answer is in front of you, you're not going to see it. So let it hit you when it's time. And, and really just to, you know, everything from just our traditions, like sometimes the songs we have are just like, again, another like another artist's interpretation of, of the Marian story. And, and um. Like there's a Spanish song called, in, in English, it's called The Diary of Mary. And it's a beautiful song. And, and, and it's just, oh, I hear it and I cry. But like the last part of the song where she's looking at him in the tomb, like what she's basically summarizing at the end is like that morning in Nazareth, I'm your servant. She's always trusting God and letting him work through her and work on her. So it's like we're called to do that. So I, I'm always inviting other takes on the story to show me a different angle, I guess you could say. And just trusting what, what's been passed on to us, too. Like a lot of times, even the messages of the apparitions are beautiful messages. My, uh, 
I think the thing that hit me the most was, and a lot of this is the Mexican experience, was the fact that, you know, the incarnation is, is, um, is uh, such a beautiful thing because it shows us our value as human beings. Jesus came as one of us. And I, and I don't know if you ever saw this. I did share this. And you know how they, we have a technology that we can use now to, um, to actually, you know, give us digital images of the shroud. Someone did this of Our Lady Guadalupe. And when I saw this, it just floored me because look at this picture. Like this is what she would have looked like in the flesh. And it is just, she is beautiful. But, you know, my, for the Mexican people to, to say, oh, she came as one of us, like she looks like one of us. And then you think about it, like all the apparitions around the world, you know, she appeared in ways that they would recognize. I mean, granted, a lot of them are depicted in sculptures and paintings as the visionaries would describe them. But the people in those areas will see her in a way that um, it, it relates to them. And to think, you know, wow, the mother of our Lord you know, not just that the Lord would come to us as one of us as a human being, but she continues his work from heaven. And, and she continues to, you know, to come to us as a mother would, but she appears to us in a way that we recognize. Like, like for example, you know, you think as a child, you know, you know, like there's those things about like, like, like your mother's scent, like you recognize your mother, you know, like, like your mother's touch, like there's those things that just you know, and, and there's those moments in our lives we, we really need our moms. And it's just, you know, I, I know in some cases with families, when, when the siblings grow up and they get married, it's hard for some of them because you have to share your parents with, like, say, your in-laws. Whereas if you think about it, to, to do that with someone you care about, that's it's a gift because we know how much we love our mothers. And then there's Jesus with John at the foot of the cross with her. He's giving her to us. You know, he's give, he gave his mother to us. So to me, that's another sign that we can trust her because our Lord gave her to us. Excuse me there with my mute. Uh, <laughs> I just absolutely love hearing you speak about Our Lady. And okay. I also have to mention that for people watching and friends of us, of, of the St. Raymond and Nottis Foundation, founded by the Mercedarian Religious Order, where Our Lady of Mercy is such a big part of us and who we pray to and who we intercede to. And so though you who are watching this presentation, you know, there's all different facets of Mary, right? And um, that's just one of them, Our Lady of Mercy, but it's a very powerful one. So uh, I just wanna thank you, Carlos, for doing such a great job with presenting Thank not you. only your relationship with the blessed mother but some really important facts and also your book again i am his mother Thank um you. so with that said i would like to put it on our um gallery view for we have our, our guest albert who, who's with us as well um wanted to open it up for any questions that any of us might have um and then we can end with a prayer so um i didn't know if anyone had a question i know i have one or two but maybe albert you might have question or two for yes. Carlos? Uh, yes, um, what is the significance and um, uh, and also uh, the reason uh, regarding Marian apparitions? You know, there are quite a few and uh, even recently um, uh, there have been affirmations by the church of Quebec or one band, Wisconsin, among others. You know, it's I always see it as mercy, um, you know, Our Lady of Mercy. Um, we have this, I think sometimes we have this idea that, you know, the people from the Bible, they, they live, they're gone, we're on our own. It's almost like this deist religious idea, like, you know, the watchmaker God that created and then just left us to our vices, if you will. Um, no, the, the spirit of the God is with us and he's sharing his mother with us. And again, the church is alive. The church is here, I mean, it's that thing that is a constant in, in human history, which is something that I'm very proud as, as a Catholic to share. And I think it's, you know, I, I can't really answer why, because it's God's will. But as, you know, as, as the first John, I think it's chapter four, where he says, you know, any spirit that acknowledges Jesus come in the flesh is of God. And all of the messages of the apparitions are consistent with, with church teaching. 
but also, you know, when you kind of go through the messages, there's always that sense of repent, but then also the apparition's always directing us to Jesus. So to me, it's like Mary, Mary's work is not done. I mean, if I, if you don't mind, I'm going to use kind of a strange example that I think might hit the nail on the head. I was reading the book that the, um, if, if you've seen that movie, the exorcism movie, The Right, I, I read the book that it was based on. And it's interesting because in the early part of the book, it says, because, you know, a lot of times exorcists will talk about, you know, the messages that they, that they get from, you know, the heavenly spirits, you know, whether it's Our Lady who's always involved or St. Michael. And they said that in the last several years, another presence has been at those exorcisms. It's actually John Paul II. And when I told, yeah, great book. And when I told my mother that, of course, talk to mom about it. My mom said, yeah, he's not done. He's still leading the church. So Mary's not done. She's not done with us. And so the way I see it, you know, if she's the mother of the church, she's probably telling the Lord, I'm going to go to my children. And, you know, and you look at all these conversions and, people who've been to these holy sites and all, and they've learned about it and what it's done to them, you know? So, you know, I, I've been to the Basilica in Mexico city twice and it, it was amazing to be there, but um, obviously people who go there from all over the world or they go to Lourdes or Fatima or whatever, those are moments that, that are life-changing for them. And whether they witness the apparition or they just learn about it and felt the presence at the place, or even just spiritually when you study it and you pray and you have a devotion, like my parish, we we have a devotion to Our Lady of Fatima and have for years, so it's it's that's a big part of, of of our of how we do things and and there's a great presence we feel of Our Lady in that particular apparition. So even though that was decades ago, she's still reaching out to us, and we can use that particular story or the message from that apparition to further uh, further our own faith lives. Yeah, you can confirm what you were saying about you know people going to. Uh, these shrines and uh, because I experienced myself, you know, I, I went to Medjugorje some mm -hmm. time back and uh, it was a, a life changing experience, you know, and uh, I didn't go, go there out of curiosity, I didn't know anything about it. I had no devotion to a lady and I didn't know anything about Marian apparitions, you know, but mm -hmm. it's, when I came back, it changed. It's something supernatural, you know, the presence Beautiful. of a lady. So, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you both for sharing. I mean, isn't it a joy, I think, for us to do this during this month of May? I mean, yes. this is what it's all about. I mean, we're taping this on May 11th, 2022. And two days from now is that feast day of Our Lady of Fatima on May 13th. It just so happens to be my husband's birthday, too. So he's got a special birthday. But, um, you know, I think we always need to remember Our Lady because she wants to pray for us. She wants to pray for all those intercessions. And she wants a relationship with us. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's beautiful that we're doing this. We have to do a part two. I'd love to do a part two at some point. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Before we end with a prayer, I know Carlos is going to end us with a prayer. Um, did uh, uh, Albert or Carlos, did you have any final words, any other, um, anything that you want to talk about before we end? I don't have uh, anything specific, but Albert, go ahead. Yes, what, uh, what I think, because I'm, it, it keeps me thinking this thing, for example, um, uh, Medjugorje, she's been appearing now for nearly 40 years, you know, and, and uh, it's just me thinking because, and some are skeptical because uh, in other apparitions, you know, Fatima, six apparitions and in, in Lourdes within a year they were over and in La Salette there was only one long apparition. Uh, but it gives me more cause for concern that she's been appearing for such a long time, you know, and, and then she's appearing under the title of the Queen of Peace. So she seems to be concerned about uh, some things which might befall mankind if they don't convert, you know. So that's mm -hmm. what I understand. Even um, I went there more than once then, uh, and and even speaking to the visionaries, you know, although they are bound by secrets, it seems there is something, you know, uh, problematic which can befall mankind if they don't uh, return back to God and convert and repent, you know. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so that's probably the reason why she's appearing for such a long time. And uh, and uh, she's still appearing, you know. And uh, so yes, so uh, so what better thing? And and incidentally, this occurrence uh, 
uh, event. I once told an evangelical, you know, and uh, about the disapparitions. And you know, normally evangelicals are very anti, anti but was an evangelical and uh, Anglican, so they're not that far away from the Catholic Church. And mm -hmm. when I told him about Medjugorje, and uh, she's been there for such a long time, and, and some people are really skeptical that the length of the apparitions and he immediately understood you know to my surprise even priests uh, some of them are not that uh, um, open to these apparitions although uh, few know that the first seven apparitions have been affirmed uh, by the church the first seven not all of them uh, and said he immediately said she's preparing the way for the second coming of her son jesus no that's how he interpreted you know like it came out so it might just well be here you know creepy and we're always called a conversion anyway so She's gonna always bring us to her son. <clears throat> some some of the films I've seen that I love, you see her bringing people to him. She, I mean, she was always gonna direct them to him. Mm -hmm. So um, even the wedding of Cana, I mean, she was directing you know the mm -hmm. wine the wine because she wanted them to see her son. This is who we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. So she you know she's always serving. She's a servant of the Lord, and mm -hmm. she's always. In, I think with the apparitions, that's exactly why she's still doing it. Mm. And that's why the evangelical Protestants, I know, they're completely wrong because they, they interpreted that we're glorifying her and, and, and she, so to speak, taking the place of Jesus, you know, and which is mm -hmm. not the case, as you were saying, she's always pointing to her son, Jesus, you know. Mm -hmm. so, well, the, the Hail Pardon? Go no, go ahead, I'm sorry. They, they completely misunderstand, that's how they interpret it, you know, uh, the, mm -hmm. especially the evangelical Protestants, you know, the Pentecostals and the Baptists, you know. Yeah. Well, the prayer itself says, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. We're not worshiping her. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that's why I wanted to get into the um, the scriptures about the saints praying for us, because that's, I mean, if they're close to, closer to God in heaven, they, they're in the presence of what we seek. They want us to join them. They want us to be there in, in heaven with them. So they're constantly interceding for us in the same way that we evangelize, because we're trying to bring people to the kingdom as well. We're all, all Catholics living in those living on earth. And I'm not going to say dead, but living in heaven. You know, we're all in the same. We all have the same mission. We're drawing. We're trying to bring people to the to the kingdom. Hmm. You know, they're alive. I mean, that's that's why we have hope in the resurrection because we we don't die. We live. So they're they are alive. They want us all to join them as well. Amen. 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 Thank you both so much. Thank Unfortunately, you. we're almost out of time. We're going to have to schedule a part two because this has been that. wonderful. And yeah. um, Carlos, for the sake of, say, Albert or those watching, can you give them your contact information and how to learn more about your ministry? Sure. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm ugh, sorry. My uh, An email you can reach me at, it, 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 easy one, because I use this for my, my books. Can you put it, it in the chat? Me. I'm sorry? Can, can you... Write it down in the chat. Yes, I can. Um, the, an email you can use is um, this is the one I tend to use for my books. Make sure, I want to make sure I spell it right too. But uh, you can use that one. And and what I'm going to do is if I can um, real quick um, get the uh, my speaker's website page because that that's uh, that's something I'll, I'll put it in the chat as well. Yes, and, absolutely. Oh, good. good. So but tell us about it maybe also if you could. Yeah, so I I am um part of Catholic Speakers. So um so this you know I've been blessed to be part of, of this um organization. So whether I go to churches and travels or whether we do virtual presentations, either one is fine. Um I do teach for a living, so a lot of times if I travel, I have to you know work around my work schedule. So that's a little challenging at times. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm off in the summer. So of course, a lot of churches are kind of not busy in the summer, but there are times I have like fall break and spring break and Tucson. It's funny. We have this thing called rodeo break where we have two days off the last Thursday and Friday of February. So everyone goes to the rodeo, quote unquote. So I have a four day weekend. So that's usually a weekend where I'm busy doing a lot of things. But, um, but I do talks on theology, of the body, I'll do stuff on a lot of Bible topics. Um, I like to work with young people, you know, but, and, and also I'm not, you know, the theology of the body has given me a lot of background in a lot of the real hard topics from the sexual ethics, marriage and all, and to have a real deep, you know, understanding of it. And of course, it's given me a lot of resources to work with. 
so that's a, that's a good way to get in touch with me. Um, what I could do also is uh, I have a Facebook page that I that I am on, which I, I'll put also in the uh, chat. But it, it's just you know that's where I connect with a lot of people, and uh, you know. But the email I have it's C Solars on a book, so it's C S O L O R Z A N O books at gmail.com. That's that's also a, an easy way to get in touch with me. I, I connect with a lot of people on there and I'll post different things and I kind of um, will, um, you know, share a lot of different, whether it's, it's Catholic current news to um, some like different, my blogs will be on there at times or, you know, other things that I'll kind of share that I think are really important. Obviously a lot of pro-life stuff right now. I just posted my uh, Facebook link. A lot of different pro-life stuff right now. You know, we pray with we pray with each other. We pray for each other. It's it's going to be a very it's a challenging time right now, but it's actually becoming a very hopeful time. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of potential change going on in, the, in our culture, and I'm very excited about it. But the one thing that I'm really excited about is I'm seeing a lot of people really seeing through a lot of the agenda, if you will, of the other side of the conversation. So regardless of where the law is, it's changing people's hearts to sort of see what they should be doing. And it, it really does see the value of, of a child's life, especially the unborn child. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging time, but it's also a very hopeful time. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, very, I'm very excited actually to see where things go. Because even if we take a hit, then we see where, where our work has to go, what we have to focus on, what we have to do in our evangelization. So. You know, I kind of have this notion in the way I live my life, even if it's just like, what are my tax problems, if you will? Tell me what I need to know and I'll deal with it. <laughs> right. Perfect advice. Um, now we are out of time, but we honestly, I really want to schedule part two. So all okay. of you who are watching this on YouTube or on Facebook or somewhere else, um, keep an eye, keep an eye on us and our, on our YouTube channel, Philly Nonatis. I also want to ask you to please do subscribe to our website at nonatus.org and make your free pastoral consultation with a Mercedarian friar. That's what we do. We offer free pastoral care for families in crisis. So thanks for joining us. Carlos, would you end us with a prayer? And I'm going to change our view so that people can just see you on that speaker view. Um, okay. And then we'll come back to say goodbye on the gallery view. So thank you. Okay. So let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your incarnation, for coming to us as one of us to show us the value of our humanity. Thank you for the redemption of humanity. Thank you for your constant reaching to us to, to change us, to be more like you out of your love for us that is never ending. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for showing us your love, even at the times when we don't always appreciate it. We also thank you for the gift of your mother to, for you to share something that is so precious to you, that is so beautiful to you, that, that was with you through your whole life, that you would love us enough to also share her with us. We thank our church for honoring her. We thank our Blessed Mother for guiding us in so many ways, for loving us as the Heavenly Mother and the Queen of Heaven that you are, and for always reaching out to us, even during those moments when we may not always be responding as we should to our Heavenly Mother. We honor you, we love you, and we ask you to constantly be with us, especially during this time when we need your maternal guidance as we look to protect the unborn. And with that, we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, thank Carlos. You. Thank, thank you, Albert, for joining us. And thank you thank for you. those who thank are watching thank on you. social media and YouTube. Keep an eye for part two. Again, okay. this is Ann DeSantis, Executive Director for the St. Raymond Anantis Foundation for Freedom, Family, and Faith. We'll see you next time. Again, thank you so thank much, you. Carlos. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much, thank Carlos. You. Thank you, man. Right. Thank Bye. you, Albert. God bless.